and welcome to something that closely resembles and may very well be a podcast. A problem podcast where we take problems which aren't always problems and provide what are not always solutions. But if anyone's prepared to embrace uncertainty, it might be us, probably. (laughs) I'm Matt Parker. I am a mathematician, if you're prepared to overlook the error bars, and occasionally have been described as a comedian. Very generous. And my co-host, whose name is Beck Hill, apparently is definitely within two standard deviations of being a comedian on stage and on screen. Oh, that's That's the nicest thing you've ever said about me. That was my uncertain intro. I thought so. (laughs) I think rigorously that's the most nicest thing I've ever... That encompasses the nice thing I've ever said about you. I think that's how that... It does. Somewhere in that range. (laughs) Yeah. And there's a decent chance that on this episode... I might be able to help you work out how to keep your bath hotter for longer. No, you're on theme. I will be doing some business maths. Business maths. And AOB, assumably other believably. (laughs) Good work. Any other business. Now, Beck, traditionally we would do our how are you doing catch-up chat right now. However, we said last episode that because by now we will have probably definitely had a million downloads, we were going to record multiple options for this section to celebrate or not my accurate prediction of a million downloads having happened by now. That makes sense. Yeah. So for the sake of... Everyone listening, hooray, yeah. we did it. Hey, we did it. Woo. Pew, pew, pew. I don't know why I'm firing guns. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, we should have bought like party poppers or something. Or We did not think this through, but oh my goodness. Uh, if wow, only what a had journey. two slightly deflated balloons with ones drawn on them. <laughs> Would you believe? You know what? I'm just going to add an M. Give me a second. <laughs> For any new listeners, um, this is in reference to the previous episode where mentioned that he helped celebrate Fibba New Year, as in the 1st of January this year was Fibonacci Day, as in 1123. And Matt showed that he had two very sad looking balloons with ones drawn on them. Yay, one million! <laughs> one million. Just put million after the ones now. He's got two of them. You yep. Hold on to those for when November comes and we have one two million. Each. Oh, one each. Can you, bring it to the, can you bring uh, it to the UK and I yeah. can collect it? Fine. I, I might have to gently untie them and let the air out, but I will... Uh, no, I, I want it best. to be fully inflated. <laughs> <laughs> I will package it up. I want you to have to smuggle them through customs wow. under your shirt. One million! <laughs> Yeah, party times. Matt, how are we going to celebrate with our listeners? Well, we did ask for listener suggestions for how we should appropriately celebrate 1 million downloads. And I don't think we're going to do any of them. Nope, none of them. Thanks for suggesting things like a live episode. I mean, we will do a live episode at one stage. But we're not even in the same hemisphere as most of our listeners now. Never mind the same city. No, we can't even do a live episode episode with our producer listening in no exactly uh someone suggested a musical episode which i don't think anyone would enjoy no i I mean i like writing musical stuff but i don't like listening to it It, it'd be a fun writing exercise but that's it would just be for us yeah yeah and no one wants to hear us sing i mean you've heard you've heard me sing multiple times it always ends up making the cut yeah it does that's more because i think it's funny she does she thinks it's hilarious that and I, I uh, hold a knife to her throat and I'm like, put my music on here. <laughs> put it in. <laughs> Get me on the waves. Whereas I never sing for exactly the same reason. So tell our lovely listeners how we're going to celebrate. Yes, we're having a bit of a chat uh, before we started recording because we figured we have to do something. And then we realized there's no better way to commemorate like a, a massive achievement other than a commemorative plate. I mean, a, m- a commemorative bowl. Yeah, a commemorative plate. No, a, a bowl. Uh, well, it de- Can you fit a spoon in to- it? Uh, commemorative bowl plate. Plate bowl. You can decide. You can order. We'll, we'll have both. You can pick. Um, you're going to get the same thing, <laughs> no matter what you pick. <laughs> but you can choose a commemorative plate versus a commemorative bowl. And whichever one we sell more of will be 
Ooh, the definitive nice. what it is. How's that? Okay, done. What I love is done. that depend because we at the time of recording this, we haven't been able to order such no. a product yet. No. We had the idea and we've done nothing. That's that's where we're at. Yeah, on the off chance that we can't find a specific commemorative bowl, I like the fact that people might still buy something labelled a bowl that clearly looks like a plate just to troll you. Well, as we know, a there's ample troll, ambiguity. If you would. Yes. <laughs> when does a troll become a trait? Ooh. Uh, <laughs> Deep. So we're gonna, we'll have a commemorative plate bowl of some description. And I, we're thinking, and again, we've not done any of the research or execution required to make this happen. But by but the time you're listening. We think we will give, we will have. Yeah. yeah. Hur- hooray, future us. Thank you, future us, for sorting this out. Let's lock future us in for a few obligations. As the reckless past us we are, I'm prepared to say we will give a free one to all our wizard level Patreon supporters. Oh, yeah, that's our top tier, isn't that- it? Yeah, there's which the top tier, <laughs> which is not particularly high, and we will absolutely lose money uh, in the short term, mm. but I feel like we must reward the Patreon supporters who have got us so far, and we, we, we hugely appreciate you all. But then, I don't know, I guess we'll do a limited run of a total number of N commemorative plate bowls. So if we'll, people want to we'll, order we'll them. we sign them? Oh do my gosh. Number them? Oh yeah, let's sign a number of them. They're commemorative, so they have to be collectible. They're commemorative. They're collectors. Yeah. Yeah. You want to get if you want to get the whole set, you got to get in early. You don't want to have to like buy one of these later off someone who did get in early. They they're going to they're going to inflate the price right up. <laughs> we may even and this is just giving future us some wriggle room. We may even have to like depending on what it costs to get these things done, pre-sell them and then we'll get them all made and send them out. But we will find a way We'll, there'll, there'll be a link in the show notes. We'll tweet it. It'll be out there. Get your commemorative plate. But you can choose commemorative plate, commemorative bowl. Hooray! Moving on, Beck. Mm. How have you been? I've been good. Well, Excellent. I had someone. I had my first person pretending to be me online. Um, I saw you tweet something about this. Yeah. Where you're like, I'm the real Beck. So- Everyone else can Beck off. But I, I didn't see the details. <laughs> it was quite, in fact, it was a pretty good scam. I was. It's annoying when they're good scams because you're like, oh, that's quite easy to fall for. Yeah, um, well played. So my yeah. Facebook, uh, forward slash Beck Hill Comedian, someone had created a Facebook profile using my pictures. And yep. then they were going through and replying to people who had left comments on my posts and pictures saying. Gotcha. Hey, thanks for the comment. Congratulations. You've won the competition. Check my pinned post for more details. And of course, what a lot of people will do as a shortcut, it's so clever because not everyone would have done this, but the shortcut would be to just click on the person to go to their Enough profile. Enough people will do that. Yeah. And yeah. then the pinned post was like, I'm doing a thousand dollar giveaway for 20 of my followers. Simply comment on one of my posts and I'll choose them at random. Yep. Yep. And so all these people wow. are like, oh yeah, maybe I did. Oh, how cool. I accidentally entered without even Beck realizing. Does crazy things. Yeah. Yeah. It's very sweet that there were enough people out there who think that I have 20 grand to just give away to people. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. Uh, yep. So it wasn't like a more recent one and they'd like put like the details of the, you know, fake competition on my photo. It was so much effort. And then, yeah, people were replying to them, asking them to message them with details. So just contact details, but also asking for their bank details so that they could transfer money. Then I saw that people were like commenting with with screenshots of bank details and stuff. And I was like, no, Um, no, 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 no. Yeah. And I reported the page as pretending to be me. And then I got an email from Facebook saying, oh, it doesn't go against our community standards. And I'm like, it should do. It's literally pretending to be me. And so I sent a reply and I haven't heard back. And so I tried it again from the fan page reporting it. And I think I've successfully banned them from the page. So they shouldn't be able to do it again. Gotcha. They can't reply to it. Yeah. So people should look for that if they ever converse with me. I am. Um, I get the. I get the lazy automated version of that on YouTube, where it's not as involved as that, but accounts will automatically steal the YouTuber's profile picture, mm. make a very similar looking account, 
and reply to comments saying something real generic like, oh, that's interesting. Let's discuss this on Telegram or oh, something. And yeah. then they'll try and bump them onto a um, side channel somewhere else. Mm. And I don't know what their end game is, but cause I just... Uh, I'll be to get them, them on Messenger or whatever you know. so they can eventually ask for their payment Yeah, details. they can try and get details or something, yeah. I mean, YouTube would normally be pretty good at filtering that stuff out, but every now and then there'll be a sudden spate of a bunch of very similar spam messages. Like someone's just found a loophole in the filters and suddenly the same sorts everywhere. So be careful, everyone. Be safe. Be careful, everyone. But that's me. That's that's my news. That happened. Good news. Also, between, because as we made it on the last episode, we did need to record these both on the same day. Just due to us traveling, we wouldn't get a chance later. So we finished recording the last episode and then took a little break. And then... Yeah, took a wee break. You ran late for the last one because you're at the beach. I was running I late did. for the most big problem, which is that I was on the toilet. And I'm <laughs> quite... Yep. Look, you, you're, you will fairly regularly, if you're trying to get in touch with me, get a WhatsApp message saying, I'm on, you know, I'm on the loop, can't talk right now, or I'll call you after. Yeah. But I'm I forgot... I've got it as some kind of shortcut. <laughs> but with Zoom... You'd turned on your camera <laughs> and there's something just very oh. weird. And like my, my camera and mic oh, were no. on mute. So you couldn't see me, but there's yeah. something really weird no. about sending a message to someone who you can see Ugh. and telling them that you're on the toilet. Yeah, no. I had to immediately turn the screen off and move my phone away. Because <laughs> I was like, mm, this is too far for me. I don't want to look at your face no, while I'm on the no, toilet. That's Thanks. Not good. I feel bad enough if I'm in some kind of really boring meeting like that I don't have to be involved with. I can easily go to the loo with my headphones on. Oh, yeah. Just to keep on my... Mute. To keep my... Even that, I'm like, uh, it's a bit unsettling. Oh, well, you you know I've done that occasionally with you guys. Oh, yeah. I've told you and Lauren that I'll, I'll have my headphones on mute. And it's handy because, you know, then there's no catch-up period. It feels after, like I'm listening to a podcast still. at that stage, but it's like a very specific podcast yeah. to do with admin. <laughs> Well, have I got a change of pace for my catch-up, Beck? I have a stump date. No. You said that the now, stump was gone. Yes. Correct. In fact, uh, for our new listeners, do you want to give everyone just a quick, as you remember it, as uh, I remember, stump date recap? At one yep. at Matt's family home, there was a big stump. And big stump. And each year they would try to remove the stump through <laughs> digging or fire, yeah, yeah, okay, I believe. Yep, yep, yep. yep and... Yep. And each time they could never fully remove the stump. Correct. Now, it, it was a bit more frequent than annual. It was just whenever there was a get together at the the Parker family residence. That doesn't make it any better, Matt. This, this, the this fact that you could, weren't able to remove it after multiple attempts per year took makes multiple it burnings. Yeah. Multiple burnings. Now, I don't know. There are probably two types of people in the world: people who've had to remove a stump and people who haven't. Stumps are real difficult to get rid of. Yeah, I've never like, removed. There's a stump. no easy way to. It's not it's not straightforward. It's a real pain. So my parents moved into their current place since the last time I was in Australia before the pandemic. So I'd never been to this place and seen the stump. They'd moved in. There was a stump. I then got updates whenever there was a stump burning. Yeah, stump Which dates. I then passed on to our fine listeners as a, as a stump date. And I was very keen for the day I got to go back for several reasons back to Australia. One of which was to join in the stump burning. However, they did so many burnings over the several years I wasn't there. They got rid of the stump. They had initially left what was what was remaining of the stump in like a, a hole in the ground. Mm -hmm. But then, and my mum was keen that I get to come and at least see, you know, <laughs> what was left of it. Um, Sorry, can I just, my, my, I have to stop for a second there because for anyone who ever sees that Matt has like over a million subscribers on YouTube and his jet set lifestyle <laughs> and he's this, uh, yeah, want, yeah. this lecturer that people like, <laughs> do, you know, crave, they fly him all around the place. He's having dinner with astronauts, all that sort of thing. It's like you're bigging this up, but carry on. He's yeah. doing Zoom calls with Jeff Goldblum at Royal Albert Hall or whatever. <laughs> And then your day-to-day -day life is stuff like your mum insists you come over to look at where a stump was. <laughs> look at the stump remains. <laughs> How the mighty have fallen. Yep. There's nothing like having family in Perth to keep you real. Yeah. <laughs> this is where, this is life. Life is what happens between the stumps. <laughs> so, so, but my dad, in a fit of gardening, buried all evidence of the stump. I missed the whole thing. Mm. I considered... 
digging down when I got there. But but then I realized, no, 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 Matthew, you're looking backwards. You've got to look forwards. <laughs> and while I've been here this time, another tree adventure has started. And I was here for the beginning this time, which I'm finding very pleasing. Um, my parents with the property have a lemon tree they don't want. And my sister and her husband have an unsuccessful lemon tree that they want to get a new one. And so I was like, look, here's what we got to do. We got to transplant across Perth a fully grown lemon tree. Literally transplant. Operation transplant is what I've been calling it. And it's not a straightforward process, moving a tree. It took a little bit of convincing to get everyone on board. Yeah, they're famously a, stationary. we could achieve. It's a combination of effort and physics to get a tree out of the ground and across the city and into another hole. But then it turns out, like, a bit like burning a stump, you want to do it in phases. My sister did some research, and what they recommend you do is initially you like dig a trench around it to sever all the roots, and then you backfill that back in again and give it a couple months to recover from the initial ah. in its natural habitat. Then you come back three or four months later, dig it back up again, and then shift it. I'm back in Perth in a couple of months anyway. There's a, there's a solar eclipse happening in Western Australia in April this year, and that feels like a compulsory thing Lucy and I have to attend. So we're going to be back to see the family in a couple of months. So I was like, let's do it. We'll dig the trench now, and then we can backfill it, and then I'll come back. We dig it out again. We move it, and I was so excited that this time I got to be there right at the beginning of, of a tree adventure. And so um, me and my brother and my dad, one afternoon, a couple of days ago, set about digging the initial you know, earthworks to get this thing going. Uh, and we, we dig down through all the roots. And you wouldn't believe what we hit. We hit stump. What? Stump. We hit one of the major roots that would have come off the tree that gave us the stump. Oh, it lives. So I, I, could, I was like, what's this? I'm like, this is a bigger root than, than the lemon tree. Massive jarrow root. I'm like, it's the stump. And so I got to, I got to get an axe and cut through one of the roots from the original stump. So wow. I got to partake in the clearing of the stump because I had to I had to cut through one of its roots to liberate the lemon tree. And do you have it now? Do I have the chunk of root I had to cut out? Yeah. You know I do. Right, let yes! me go grab it. Hang on, wait here. Yeah, I I knew I could rely on I you. Hang on. He's got a root. There it is. Wow. Oh, That's a stump. nice chunk well, of wood. Th thank you. It's, well, it's Jarrah. The, the double That's entendres the in this, by the way. I This is how amazed I am <laughs> yeah, okay. by what yep. you're showing me, is that I haven't gone for any double entendres, even though they're right there. There's been very few root jokes, very few wood jokes. Great mm. work. Thank you. Um, there it is. Look at that chunk. It's Look at bigger than I expected. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. There you go. So, So now I've got a massive chunk of original stump. Wow. And... I don't know what to do with it. So I'm open to suggest. What do you think, Beck? What should I do with this? Well, there's, you see, there's several options. You know me. I love burning stuff. So my initial reaction is. <laughs> you do. You do. Yeah. <laughs> take, take it back to your your cool um, bonfire at do home. My, my mass fire pit. Your yep. fire pit and burn it in there. But that is a really nice. I can't. That's a <laughs> nice. That's a nice yep. chunk of material you got there. And that feels. That's burning it. it feels like a yeah. bit of waste. I like the idea of making something out of it. I would. Yeah. I was thinking, what if I got it sliced up into like coasters, Ooh. sliced and then varnished or oiled or whatever, make mm. some jarra coasters. That you was need my, someone was who knows about wood. Yeah. So, listeners, tell you what, I'll I'll get some photos of this. Mm -hmm. We'll share those. Um, I want suggestions. What should I do with the stump that I thought was gone and buried and and never to be seen again? It's a problem yeah. dot com and select solution. And maybe Pick just chuck, chuck the word wood in there or root in capitals so it's easier for us yeah, to find. Yeah, put stump. <laughs> Make sure you put stump because I'll just search for stump later and then I'll find all the suggestions. Stump. So, okay. Stump. Um, yeah. So there you are. The stump date lives on. Piece of the stump. This story went way better than yep. I could have ever imagined. But I did think you were going to say that <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> you saw where the stump had been and then you secretly planted a seed for a Jarrah tree. <laughs> oh, for a new one. <laughs> Because that is a that is a long game, ga like joke. That a is real long game, really yeah, long. Yeah. 
Our first problem today back has been sent in on the problem posing page at a problem com from Anastasia, who says, well, first of all, they say, hey, Beck and Matt, you guys are great. Love the podcast. <laughs> I love when lovely. people send that. Thanks, Anastasia. Even if we don't answer their, quest- do. their problems, it's nice. They go on to say, also, I have a problem. They're just having a bubble bath. I guess they listen to podcasts in the bath. That makes sense. And over time, it's obviously gotten colder. That's that's deep. That's that's the universe for you. <laughs> um, but also, the bubbles have decreased. So I started wondering whether bubbles make a bath stay warm for longer because of the trapped air in them. Thinking face emoji. And the problem is, how do I keep my bath warm the longest? Smiley face emoji. So, Beck, the problem is, well, I guess the, qu- the question is, do bubbles in a bubble bath keep it warmer longer? And the problem is, how do you keep a bath the warmest for the longest? Ah, oh, well, first of all, Anastasia, thank you for sending a bath-related problem in because I love baths <laughs> and it gave me an excuse to take baths and call it science. Huh? So, first of all, yes, Anastasia's correct. The bubbles do make a bath stay warm for longer because of the trapped oh. air. It creates an insulation that stops the water from evaporating or, you know, leaving the heat radiation, that Ooh. sort of thing. Because the way I was thinking of it is normally you'd have hot water and then air contacting it. The air would heat up and then convect away and new cold air would fill its place. That yes. would then absorb more heat from the water. Whereas I guess the bubbles they stop that convection loop because it warms up the air in the bubbles, but then it doesn't go anywhere. It's like, ah, it stays here. Yeah, well, it certainly slows it because the structure eventually breaks down in the bubbles. Oh, yeah, the bubble, bubble eventually... burst. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that will, they will eventually You stay warmer down. for longer. Yeah, You do, yeah. There, there is a, there's a lot of stuff out there about how actually using bubble bath is, you know, it's not so much about making you clean. It's just about keeping your bath warmer for longer so you don't have to use as much energy. You don't have to refill the bath. Oh. And I've I've often said this because Gavin, my husband, he doesn't mind some bubbles, but he doesn't. If I, I like to have as many bubbles as possible, I like to have enough bubbles that I can hide in the bath and that yep. you can't really see me. That's my favorite type of of amount of bubbles, where like it's just two right. eyes poking out from a sea of bubbles. Comedy film levels of bubbles. Oh, totally. Yeah, that's my. Yep. I, I just something to play with. Put in your head. Pretend it's a beard. It's always. I've never aged out Love of that, it. and I hope I never do. I hope that even when I'm at an age where I need a walk-in bathtub, I, I yep. still want to still be bubble beard. sticking bubbles on my head. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, got it. Love it. Great. There are no downsides to the bubbles, is what you're trying to say. Exactly. But Gav doesn't like the bubbles. He just finds them annoying. Oh. He doesn't like the huh. feeling of too many bubbles. He's just not... A, so what, he, what we tend to do is if I run him a bath, I'll do, obviously, yep. always too much bubbles, and then... We yep. have to use the shower head to sort of water them down a bit so that they... Oh, you debubble. Um, yeah, they're sort of... They become like condensed. Does that work? Oh. You sort of I guess end then up with... And as long as you don't re-lather it, then it stays flat. Yeah, kind so of like... So what you're saying is, you're saying that Gav likes a flat white of the bubble bath world and you're in a cappuccino oh of the goodness. bubble bath world. Our baths are the same as our coffee preferences. There you go. You're both. Oh. You're consistent in your opinion on foam. Okay. Now, just as a side quest, I need to know if that's a thing for everyone. If you, right. if you have okay. a preference, yeah. you need right. to have a preference in coffee for this to work. Ah. I think if you don't yep. really yes. have a preference, yes. or if you don't drink coffee, I don't want anyone like. Oh well, I don't normally, but I sometimes have flat white. But it's just whatever they give to me. No, I don't. No, I don't no, care. No. What I want to know no. is if you no. have a preference for a type of coffee and a preference for amount of bubbles in the bath. Do you find that those two correlate? Are they the same? So well, I can provide one more data point because I'm a flat white kind of person, mm. and I'm also not a big bubble bath kind of person. <gasps> I'm. I have to admit, I'm there with the minimal bubbles as well. Whoa. So hey, yeah. Lu- what does Lucy drink? Oh, that's a good question. Well, she is. De- she's definitely. And I hate to run this down gender stereotype lines. I think she's pro bubbles. But she would be a flat white. I know she likes bath salts, though. She's like, yeah, that's true. I know because I've had a bath at your place and there were bath salts and I was like, ooh. (laughs) Yeah, you put put our bath salts on the internet, if I remember correctly. I did. Because they were called like (laughs) 
do- when they call like Doctor Salt, Salt, and I was like, oh, it's like yeah, something like that, Doctor Pepper's <laughs> brother or whatever. Yeah, you're like, I, I didn't study this long to be called Mrs. Salt. <laughs> oh, that was it. Yeah. Okay, go ask her. Yeah, Lucy does not conform. She's a flat white, and lots of bubbles in the bath. Mm. So, so we need more data points. I mean, that's why I love that woman. She bucks the trend. So when this episode comes out, we'll do a poll. Bubble or nubble? If you have a preference for coffee, the amount of bubbles you have in coffee, i.e. flat white, latte, cappuccino, does it match the your bubble bath preference in baths? Yes or no? And then if you want to elaborate right. and say, yes, I have flat white and this, or yep. no, I have a cappuccino, but I don't like bubbles, then you yeah. can do that in the replies. That'll just be extra data. Got it. And so don't partake in the survey unless you have opinions on both bubble baths and coffee, milk-based coffee. Yeah. And then just we just want to, do, do, does it match or not? That's all we're after. Yeah. What about the fact that I traditionally, I drink my coffee, just black coffee, and I tend to rather have a shower. Hmm. I mean, that's no, that's I think no black, frills either way. The coffee, black coffee equivalent is having nothing in your bath. You just go and sit in there for a while and contemplate yeah. the world. Go yeah. On, okay. I don't want to hear from you if you're a shower, it's like if you bath. don't have baths. No, you, your opinion is invalid. Got it. Okay. All right. So now we're away from our side quest. We've done. We've got, we've got our side Sorry. quest. Okay. Meanwhile. <laughs> meanwhile, I was happy with the amount of evidence out there that bubbles make the bath stay hotter for longer. I wanted to got see it. if you put anything more in the bath. Would it? You oh. Know? So um, apparently yep. salts can make the bath stay hotter for longer because salt water oh. holds heat for longer then oh, yeah, pure yeah. water. Different uh, specific heat. I can see that. Bath oils act yeah. like an insulator as well. And so I thought I'll do a control bath first. So mum's got a massive Very bath. Very good of you. Great. Yep. So I did a control bath. And yep. uh, so I measured the temperature of the bathroom, which I yep. know because mum has a thermostat. And so the bathroom is at a very comfortable 26 degrees. Ooh, lovely. Mm, yeah, it was very nice. And then I filled the bath and I made sure I measured how far the water was from the top so that when I did the experiment again, I'd be able to know. Be consistent. Yeah, nice. And so I ran my bath. And this is where I started to realize how many variables there are because the yeah. way that I run my baths is I tend to run them far too hot and then I let them okay. cool a bit or I then stick in the cold a, water. Yeah. You because, overshoot the mark and then wind it back. Yeah, yeah. And I'll come back to that as well, but I just want to point that out that that's how I do it because I will come back to that. So I ran my hot bath and then I put cold, cold water in until yeah. it was the right temperature for me. Did you measure yeah. the temperature or was well, this just first I put in my thing, you know, I did the thing where I was like, oh, this is the temperature that I'd want to get in. And then yeah, realized, oh, I need an actual thermometer. So I've used my mum's meat thermometer because... There wasn't anything else. <laughs> right. Yep. Had to yeah, Sarah clean yeah. before she rose. It's a thermometer. So we put the. I'm a meat. So we put the meat thermometer in the bath, <laughs> and yep. yep. Turns out now I'll be honest. When I did get in, I was like, actually, I've made this. This is now too. This is actually hotter than I wanted. But I'd already oh, right. done all okay, the other okay, measurements because yeah, yeah. normally I wouldn't You're get not in. Not doing it was more like, measurements. It was forty three degrees. Oh. Dang, and that was, is hot. <laughs> you know it's hot oh. when you can see the pink line on your lips. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and so I was yeah. like, okay, I've, I've made a mistake here, but I'm this far ahead and I can't go back. I love the fact that the level of discomfort of sitting in 43 degree water <laughs> is less than your discomfort in having to redo a data measurement. <laughs> this is how I roll. <laughs> I'm, I'm very comfortable in being uncomfortably hot. As you, I get cold <laughs> real easy. I don't like being wow. cold. I do not mind being too hot. So That was not a risk here. I had the bath, but then the problem with that is that it didn't really go down in temperature for ages. So I ended up having to sit in the bath for an hour and a half. And <laughs> I, so I got really dehydrated, by the way, guys. You should definitely drink water before doing any experiments like this. Yep. And Yeah, because uh, you're basically in a very wet sauna. <laughs> yeah. And then by the time I came out and I did that, I made sure like the window was shut so that the, the temperature of the bathroom stayed the same. And then when I got out an hour and a half later, I remeasured the water and it was 37.7 degrees or 37.8. That's a reasonable bath temperature. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So by the time I got out, it was like a reasonable temperature because that's like almost body temperature. Right. And that's, you know, our ideal. Yeah. But that's not a huge shift when you think about it. That's No, it's not. It's a very small amount. 
and that's without bubbles or anything. And then I was like, well, again, yeah, yeah. I've already gone this far. So the next day, <laughs> yep, yep. 26 degrees, same air temperature in the bathroom. Yep. Decided to recreate it, but with a cup of bath salts, half an ounce of bubble bath. And this is all in the same bath. In the same bath. And then I did two teaspoons of baby oil. Because so I was like, well, I'll do all of them and see just... Just everything. If everything yep. together... And made sure the temp, you know, temperature was the same getting in. So I was scolding myself getting in again. You, another scolding <laughs> bath. Yeah. And uh, only you could have a sunk cost <laughs> fallacy in a bath. <laughs> and then an hour and a half later, which I'll be honest, I think I've lost a lot of weight for just two days of baths that are far too hot for in me. A bath. I measured it and it was the exact same from the day before without bubble. It was 37.7 degrees. It was at this point that I was like, yep. I think I'm in too warm a temperature at like atmosphere, like climate, I should say, for right. to really properly measure this experiment. Because even though the yep. air outside the bath is less than the temperature of the bath itself, it's... It's a pretty Rather comfortable amount. So it's going to slow that process yeah. real, like right down. It's not exactly cold air that the water's coming in contact with. I, I don't know if this would be the case, but it feels like your body temperature and the bath temperature are just equalizing. So the bath's cooling down to the point where your body is warming it back up again. And, and so it's just plateauing out once it reaches back temperature. Yeah, possibly. I think I don't eventually know that, it would get colder because yeah, I feel like yeah, I don't less. think a human body is enough to keep a bath warm. No, it's not. I can tell you that from my would a fluffy coat keep you insulated from the heat experiment. Gotcha. In a previous episode, my core body temperature will stay the same or should stay the same for a long time, but my skin temperature yep. is different and that would Gotcha. Do what it could to try and cool itself down. So anything that's outside of the water will try and release any heat. So both the water and my body are going to try and release the heat. Everything but is getting rid of heat. Gotcha, I think gotcha, because gotcha. the air temperature outside of it isn't that much lower than I'm... six degrees. Yeah. I'm sort of... I'm keeping it warmer for longer because yeah. nothing's cooling me down. There was no air movement and, you know, there's nothing to no. to help me cool down especially so i sort of gave up the experiment at that point <laughs> and realized good that work, good work oh, sorry i've had I'm having whiplash in your approach to the sunken cost fallacy. <laughs> because... at one point you're like well i'm in too deep better push on and then you're like Ack. right right the whole thing off well because i was like because what i was gonna do is then try it like with just bubble bath or just bath salts yep, or yep, just yep. body oil but after doing like what felt like the two extremes and then comparing them and then getting the same getting result. The same. I was like, well, this <laughs> yep, isn't, yep. This isn't yep. helpful at all. I then realized, because I did some research, that one of the solutions for keeping a bath hotter for longer is to preheat the bathtub because the bathtub itself will ah. start to disperse the heat depending on how well insulated yep. the bathtub is. Obviously, some yeah. not all baths are created equal, and if you have a bath that doesn't have any proper insulation around it, then that bathtub itself will cool down quicker. Or if you're putting hot water yep. into a cold bathtub, then it will take on some of that and disperse it more quickly. Whereas if the bathtub is already hot, then it will take longer for the hot water inside to disperse the heat. Because It's like making a coffee. You want to preheat your coffee making equipment. So you don't lose all the temperature from the water. If you're a nerd, sure. Correct. <laughs> it is like a coffee. We're always bringing it back to coffee. And so... I've just... I've only got one thing and I'm, I'm making it work. I love it. No, it's perfect. It does work. It's, it's a really good comparison. So then I realized that's the way that I run my baths, where I run all hot water first. That's what I'm doing. I'm preheating the tub because I'm making it hotter than it needs yeah. to be before cooling it down. So then it's in that time, it yep. it's heating up the bathtub. And I was like, oh, there's all these variables and it's not even easy for me to, to measure them all. Also, 
I, my home is in a state that is quite prone to droughts. And while they did have a pretty wet season <laughs> yes. this year, I can't keep yeah. having baths. Yeah. That Bath after bath after, yeah, it's a lot of yeah. water. Yeah. So, in order to help answer Anastasia's question, I'm going to need the help of our listeners. And I'm aware that we've asked ah. a lot of our listeners already. But if anyone like me loves a bath and you're having them regularly, and it's a lot colder over there right now. Yeah. You know, it's a lot colder in the UK. I say over there. But like, it depends where planet. you're listening. Yeah. But if you're based in the UK or anywhere that's cold, or especially anywhere that's colder than the UK, and you have a bath and you are able to measure the temperature of the room, the temperature of your bath, I would love to know. I don't want people to do too much. Obviously, do what you like. The more data, the better. Yeah. But if you wouldn't mind having two baths where you change our variable to see what keeps it hotter for longer. So what I'll need from you, if you're wanting to help out with this experiment, is I'll need to know the air temperature of your bathroom, the temperature of your bath before you get in, the temperature of your bath after you get out. Yep, yep, sometime later. How long your bath was for and your bath technique. So whether you fill up the hot water first and then cold water, whether you try and get the water the perfect temperature from the start, whether anything, anything that you do that might be different. And then if you could do the same again, but change variables that are within your bath and let me know if the results yeah. differ. So everyone, get on over to the problem posing page at problemsquared.com and give us your bath results. At some point in the future, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll report back. Yeah, and then hopefully your, you'll have your, your answer solutions. then, Anastasia. I'm going to withhold the ding for now until okay. we have some more, more dingable data. This wing ding slash dinglet comes from Cedric, who says, Say you are a salesman tasked with acquiring new customer accounts throughout a year. Now, at the end of the year, you are tasked with planning for your next year's sales numbers. You need to estimate how much more these new customers will buy next year compared to this year. You know, however, that accounts that were acquired in January had the whole year's worth of sales on the books, while accounts opened at the end of the year only bought for one month. So you expect early accounts to increase very little and accounts open later to increase significantly. What I want to calculate is if all other things remain constant, what would the overall percentage increase be just due to the variance in when the accounts started buying. Matt, I didn't understand any of that. I didn't. I read the whole thing <laughs> yeah. and I was thinking yep, about yep. halfway through, I don't know what any of this means at all. Yep. yep. There's business for you. Business. Um, so Cedric manages salespeople. That's the, sh the short version of this. And so he hires someone as a salesperson and says... Right, we make great products here, or whatever they do. I don't know, actually. You go sell, sell products. those products. Get us new customers. Yeah. They find a customer. They're like, hey, you want to be our customer? And the person's like, you're right, I, I do. And then you assume, henceforth, they put all their business through you. And so just as an assumption to make life a bit easier, we're assuming once one of these salespeople gets a new customer, they're just now constantly ordering through through their company to get these mm -hmm. things. So the spend is, you can just assume it's just a constant rate. The problem is, when you've got salespeople, there's like, obviously you get new customers and they spend money, but then you want to know, are they spending more? Are they spending less? Like you want to be able to track the amount of spending they're doing. Mm. The issue is, if in the first year, you got a new customer halfway through the year. Across the entire year, they're only buying for six months. Mm -hmm. And the next year, they're buying for 12 months. So on paper, they've doubled their spend. But you're okay. like, well, hang on. But, you know, that, that wasn't because they're buying any more. It's just because they've been buying for longer. That's an assumption there that whenever you do the... And I'm sure it is the case, but when you do these calculations, you're always yep. doing it on like a yearly basis. Would it not make more sense yes. just to have a different thing for each customer? <laughs> I suspect, and again, I'm not a business person, so I don't know the full details. I think it's probably things like annual bonuses, end of year accounts. I think the, the business world lives and dies by the, 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 the four quarters of the business year. Mm. So I, I think there's a re that they want to be able to chunk things into years. 
and you're right it'll be it'll be better if every customer had their own separate cycle because then you could compare it a lot better but i guess customers come customers go they want some kind of just sense of um how, how do you compensate or, or allow for the just the natural increase because they've been a customer for more of the year than they were before versus any genuine increase in the amount of spend because mm-hmm. maybe you got a particularly good salesperson and Cedric did send me through they they had a stab at trying to work this out mathematically and and hit a dead end it's not a straightforward thing to work out but i if i know one thing about business again not a business guy mm-hmm. if i know one thing about business you want to make a slide deck so i i actually made a one slide presentation to send back to Cedric with my results oh, great. on when I work this out for them. But I thought I'd try and, given this is an audio medium, describe it to you mm-hmm. and then see if that works. And then I, we can always make the deck available if people want to have a look at what I actually did. Okay. But I, I imagined drawing like a bar to represent a customer buying things. So if they were buying things for the whole year, that the bar would be the length of the whole year. If they were only buying things for half a year, the bar would be half as long, quarter of a year would be much shorter again. Mm-hmm. And so I imagine that a new salesperson is bringing on clients at a regular rate, like a new client every month, let's say. And this is within the assumptions that Cedric said kind of work with their business. And so I was like, well, you, you're going to, let's say you bring on 12 clients, one a month. Your first client's going to be a bar that's the whole length of the year. The next one's going to be a bit shorter. But I, then I drew that kind of above it. Next one's going to be a bit shorter again, and then a bit shorter again, and a bit shorter again, and a bit shorter again. You're actually making like a triangle. You've got a yeah. long one at the bottom, yeah. and then each one above it gets a bit shorter. Then the second year, they're all full length bars. So mm-hmm. you've got a massive rectangle. And actually, the triangle is half the area of the rectangle because ah. they're getting grad- consistently shorter all the way up. Mm-hmm. And so it's it's half. So in fact, if you... And this goes, it's not just salespeople, it's not just clients. If you've got anything where things start consistently and once they start running, they produce consistently, then if they're gradually starting up over the course of some time period, let's say a year, and then they continue running for another time period, the second time period will have double the output of the first one. Yeah. Just by a nature of their coming online gradually and then they continue running. And it's such a quick simple geometric way of doing it and the answer drops out and is quote unquote obvious whereas if you try and do it algebraically or working it out it's a it's a mess absolute nightmare and that's one of the things i love about mathematics sometimes it's just the way you approach the problem the way you think about it makes a difference to how hard or how easy it is and a lot of the time when people say oh that person's good at maths or oh they they solve things quickly They've just seen more problems and they know more ways of going about it and ways to think about it. And so I'm like, the, when I heard the problem, I'm like, I bet there's a geometric way to picture this, mm. which will make sense. Does that only work if the new customers being acquired, is it also at a constant rate? Yes, yeah, because- so it, it requires that assumption. You'd have a different shape if they were coming in a different rate. Yeah. But what's interesting is if 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 you think about it, because I already kind of gave part of the game away when I said, imagine one customer starting in the middle of the year. Yeah. Because well, that you're straight sort away doubles. You see it doubles. Yeah. With I've only just managed to understand what the problem is, I think. Because basically what they want to <laughs> yeah, know yeah, yeah. is, let's say the customer, if we're going to keep this customer for the oncoming years, how much, how many commemorative plates are we going to need to have in stock in order to supply the customer next yeah. year? Yeah. So is it not similar to how you worked out when we would hit a million listeners? Like, are you not just looking at previous data? So if a customer came on in November, so they've only been buying for two months, wouldn't you just take what they bought in that two months and then go, okay, well, let's times that by a six because that's 12 months. (laughs) But what the, the difficulty lies in, how do you then sum that up across a bunch of customers? And where Cedric got caught in a knot was they were like, oh, ones that start in January will be the same. They will be a 0% increase. And the ones that start in February, well, they've got 11 twelfths. So they're going to have one more. It's an extra 11th because of the length of the year. And so what Cedric was trying to do is take that approach of the same rate, but over more time. 
mm. but then work it out for a bunch of different ones and then find a way to how do you how do you combine them how do you to do give it for you the all the customers as opposed percentage? to just doing yeah. each individual customer yeah okay whereas geometrically you don't have to do any of that you just look at it and you're like oh it doubles and that that's the same result you'd get if you then did a, a whole bunch of individual hypothetical customers and then add them all up and then work out what the total percentage increase would be you get the same answer but it's what just would a happen long, complicated if, journey if the customers being acquired were at non normal nothing that creates a nice gym like geometrical shape yeah then you'd have to i mean what you could do in reality is get a bunch of previous data which is what i kind of did last episode when i was doing the prediction for a million was not try and work out what the shape was just look at the data that and just know like i had to know over what interval to average to then get the previous shape not try and name it or work out what it is and then just duplicate it to predict the future mm -hmm. so so in a messier situation that's what you would do whereas mm -hmm. um cedric gave me a bunch of assumptions saying they they come on roughly evenly and they they continue to spend about the same um but what but in reality what's actually happening is they they are hoping the customers will buy more over time because the mm. commemorative plates are just so good. And what they want to be able to do is work out how much of that, their good product, their good sales, their good whatever, and how much is just they've been customers for a longer amount of the year. And so this doubling as a kind of a baseline means they can kind of compensate for that. And anything above that is is a genuine increase. That's not just... Um, the effect of having more customers and over a big enough company with enough customers the variations will all kind of average out and so that's mm -hmm. just kind of a nice you know handy way to know what's a genuine increase and what's just they've been buying stuff for longer increase yeah do you want to see the slide yeah of course i do I, i'm curious to know how close uh, i labeled it year one and year two and then you got customers coming on making a triangle and then you got a rectangle yeah that's, yeah, that's pretty much what I envisaged. That's very pleasing. There you are. That was my, my solving a business problem using a diagram. It was a very nice diagram. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's very uh, satisfying. You should put that on a t-shirt, Matt. Put that on a commemorative <laughs> plate. <laughs> that's your solution. I should. Ah, oh, commemorative plates at the time I solved that problem with a diagram. <laughs> We're not doing that, everyone. I feel like commemorative plates are going to be a slippery slope. Like your diagram. Not my diagram. Num number of plates. Number of hilarious joke-related plates released in a year. Slash balls. Slash balls. Same well, thing. Well, I'm going to give that a ding. Hey. A, a business ding. Geometric business ding. GBD. Now, I know you're thinking that was a lot of business, but what about if there was any other and there is is thank you to everyone who sends in comments feedback and add-ons additions to our previous solutions including david who jumped on to the problem posing page at problemsquared.com and flagged up well actually back I'll, I'll i'll let you handle this one because it was when you were talking about the reviews of the bell tower in perth on tripadvisor yeah so david said during a problem squared 050 you briefly mentioned the circle rating for the bell tower in perth on tripadvisor and gave a small chuckle about it because we were laughing about how it's five circles it's like dots yeah. yeah yeah now david pointed out that the reason for the circles is so that people don't get confused with the star ratings for hotels because if you were ah. to, you know, give something a five star rating on TripAdvisor, that's not the same as the, you know, the proper star rating that is given to yes. hotels. And so you don't want people getting confused. And I think that's fair enough. Yeah, so, I think it makes sense. Yeah. If someone sees a hotel on TripAdvisor with a four star rating, it doesn't mean they're going to have a hot food service menu across certain hours as is required of a four star hotel or whatever the case may be. Yeah, exactly. But David also pointed out that the internal name for them are bubble ratings. Isn't that cute? Yeah. Bubble. Bubbles. Bubbles. I feel like David, if that is their name, is a, uh, you know, anonymous source from within the TripAdvisor machine. Seems to be. Wow. Well, I give <laughs> David a five bubble rating. So thank you, David. And someone else chipped in to let us know that the Scottish tune played um, on the bells is called... 
Craglia. Cra- How would you pronounce that, Beck? So that was the. Um, oh wait. Oh, so that right. I was thinking Scottish tune, as in the Robert Burns one in Perth. Yep. But they're pointing out that Waltzing Matilda is a Scottish tune. Um, oh. Yeah, so apparently it's called the Craigie Lee, written in around the 1800s and was adapted ah. to be the music for Waltzing Matilda by Banjo Patterson. Oh, so I did not know it was a Scottish there's tune. There's your Scottish link again. Again. Uh, classic Perths. And finally, a huge thanks to everyone who listens to this podcast, particularly those of you who give us a five bubble rating on whatever your bubble rating platform of choice Maybe, and particularly, particularly those of you who put your money where your bubbles are and (laughs) you support us on Patreon. This has been a bubble-heavy episode, hasn't it? Thanks. We hugely appreciate all our Patreon supporters. Not only are we giving free commemorative plates (laughs) to the top tier, the wizard tier of our Patreons, but we pick three names at random every time to thank, which this time includes... Remo. Craig Anderson. Earl and Bakboo. So thank you very much to them and everyone else on a Patreon. And that's it for the podcast. Or is it? I think it is. It probably is. I've been Matt Parker for the vast majority of the time, and I'm fairly certain I was joined by Beck Hill, um, if that is your name. <laughs> So, Matt. Yeah. You know how we didn't have anything for our post credits? No, it was a real void at the end of the show last time. Yeah. Well, I think it'd be nice if the listeners can get to know us a bit better. Oh. So, okay. I thought I would uh, find out. I feel like we overshare enough in the main episode, but carry on. I thought you might want to know what tree sign you you are. What, what, what? Yeah. There's a quiz online. What kind of tree are you? Find out your tree astrology with Love Celtic it. tree astrology. <laughs> That's great. You can always trust a sign uh, that repeats itself. Yes. Yep. So uh, and ha- and you don't have to do anything. You answer. No, you don't have to do anything actually. But I thought you know you you did your stump date, so I thought you might want to know what yeah what tree sign you are. So I know that your uh, birthday's in December. Correct. So you're an elder tree. The seeker. An elder tree. Yeah. Elder huh. types tend to be freedom loving and sometimes appear to be a bit wild compared to the other Celtic tree astrology signs. In younger years, you may have lived oh, life that's... in the fast lane. And as a thrill seeker, <laughs> you and your boogie board, we are often yes, misjudged. Mate, as an, you are often misjudged as an outsider and you have a tendency to be withdrawn despite your extroverted nature. You tend to be very considerate of others wow. and genuinely strive to be helpful. These acts of assistance are sometimes thwarted by your brutal honesty. <laughs> Elder signs fit well with older and holly signs. What a series of wide sweeping statements that would apply to anyone. I haven't had a cold reading that good all week. <laughs> Do you want to know what I am? I, I, I want to guess you tend to be extroverted except for times when you just want to be by yourself. <laughs> Is that right? Am I getting that right? No, actually. What uh, it's, tree are you, It's not Beck? bad. First of all, mine's not even a tree. I'm a reed. That's not even a tree. What? I'm a grass. You got a tree. Reeds Dang. among the Celtic tree astrology signs are the secret keepers. Now that's a lie. I cannot keep a secret to save my life. I I nearly gave away precious secrets on this very podcast. You dig deep inside <laughs> to the real meaning of things and discover the truth hidden between beneath layers of distraction. Nope, I never get past the layers wow. of distraction. I am constantly. <laughs> Stuck in the layers of distraction. Famously uh, as much as I undistractable. Want the <laughs> when there is a need to get to the heart of the matter, the read sign will most certainly find the core. That's, to be fair, you know me, I love a deep dive. I will get distracted, but I'll, you know, I will do the deep dive. Yep. You love a good story and can be easily drawn in by gossip, correct? Scandals, sure. Legend and lore, yes. These tendencies mm. also make you an excellent historian, no. Journalist, mm. detective or archaeologist, mm. nah. Uh, okay. <laughs> Maybe detective, but archaeologist, nah. I'll give you detective. Yeah. I do like digging things up, though. You love <laughs> people true. because they represent a diversity of meanings for you to interpret. Read, well, I am. That's what I'm doing right now. Read signs join well with ash or oak signs. Whoa. You know what, Beck? Mm. If I was you, I wouldn't read too much into it. 